Until now, we have been studying various ways to charge an electric vehicle with the power from the grid. But can you imagine supplying power to the grid from your vehicle? If you look at it, what are electric vehicles if not batteries on wheels? Because why not? Now before we understand how it works, we need to understand why it can help. So let's start with understanding the demand and supply at a grid level. Traditionally, all the electricity generated is sourced from coal, natural gas or hydropower or even large scale solar farms. This means that it is produced at one remote location and transmitted to multiple locations over long distances with HV cables. This implies a centralized system. Like all centralized systems, this system is not very resilient and prone to downtimes. The thing about electricity is, you cannot hold it. It has to be consumed the minute it is generated. Storing electricity feels routine when we see laptops, mobiles or even electric vehicles. But on the grid level, it's much more difficult to store energy and it's very expensive. This presents a challenge for grid service providers who regulate the distribution of electricity. Predicting demand beforehand and matching the supply, adjusting for irregularities and demand fluctuations from region to region, ah, it's a tough job. One more very sad fact about centralized power generation system is that it is prone to huge losses. While you transmit electricity over long distances, there are inevitable transmission losses. This means when you consume one unit of one unit or one kilowatt hour of electricity, four units were generated, three were lost on the way. So guys, save energy. When you save one unit of electricity, you are essentially saving four units of energy. All the traditional sources that were listed above are not capable of scaling up or scaling down instantaneously as per demand fluctuation. Like a 20 megawatt thermal power plant running on coal cannot instantaneously supply 25 megawatt in the evening when we all switch on our lights together or reduce to 10 megawatt in the afternoon when industrial and residential activity is lowest. Similarly, a hydropower plant also cannot increase or decrease its capacity based on demand. As per the Indian daily electricity demand curve, energy consumption rises from morning 6 am and peaks around 11 am. Then during afternoon hours, electricity demand drops and rises again in the evening time to maximum because of use of lights and systems, air conditioning, because as people get home from office, uh, they start using up electricity. Solar and wind energy are extremely intermittent in nature. At 3 pm when the solar is at peak, the requirement is not really on peak. Electricity prices also follow the same trend. When energy demand is high, rate of electricity also increases and when demand is low, rates per unit also drop down. In cases of high electricity demand, like in the evening, the grid has to resort to peaker plants. These plants are private and run only when the grid asks them to offset the demand. They are extremely inefficient and expensive, often using the dirtiest means to generate power. No one likes peaker plants, even the grid. Now that we know the challenges of the grid, let's see how an electric vehicle can help. As I said before, electric vehicles are batteries on wheels. One very important statistic of private vehicles is that they are parked for 95% of their usable life. They are a highly underutilized asset. Suppose there are 2000 electric vehicles in a town, each with a 50 kWh battery pack. These are connected to the grid while they are parked. If all these batteries are virtually pooled together, they translate to 100 megawatt hour capacity, enough to supply power to a town of 30,000 people for a complete day, thus creating a virtual peaker power plant big enough to replace the dirty ones uh, that are used in peak hours. So this enables the users to accumulate energy in the low demand periods, like in the afternoon when the electricity tariff is low and reserve the energy in their electric vehicle. After reserving the energy they need for operating the vehicle, they sell it back to the grid, which is surplus, at a profit in high demand periods, like in the evening. 
Going one step forward, if we couple the car's battery with the solar on the rooftop, we have clean energy in the grid. Such a practice will decentralize the grid and reduce our dependence on polluting sources of energy, making our grid more resilient to adversities. Electric vehicles will help to destabilize the fluctuations of the grid. In general, electric vehicles are designed to accept charge. The ability to push out the stored energy is what enables a vehicle to transfer electricity to the grid. But how does this work? Well, when an EV is charged, EC or alternative current electricity from the grid is converted to DC electricity, the kind that can be used by a car. This conversion is carried out by either the car's own converter or a converter located in the charger. Then, when you want to use the energy stored in the EV's battery for a house and or send it back to the grid, the DC electricity used in the car logically has to be converted back to AC. Although currently there aren't many bi-directional EV chargers out there, all contain internal converters. This means that they can handle the electrical conversion back from DC to AC. They can even control the amount of power supplied to and fro from the battery. Such a type of energy transfer enables technology like vehicle to grid. But there are more ways this can be useful. Let's consider vehicle to home. Vehicle to home or V2H mode can be implemented by supplying power from the battery to the home during a grid power outage or any natural calamity. Let's consider V2V, vehicle to vehicle. As per its name, this system allows the transfer of electrical energy from one electric vehicle to another. So, so the advantage of this system is, let's imagine a scenario where you are driving an electric vehicle and due to some reason you were not able to charge your vehicle fully to cover the return journey towards home. So your vehicle is now out of charge and you are stuck in the middle of nowhere. In this case, with the help of V2V charging, we can use another nearby vehicle which is at higher state of charge to charge your vehicle just enough to reach the nearest charging station or home. One requirement for this is communication. Communication between vehicle A and vehicle B. Main challenge in V2V charging is that different automakers use different charging protocols and different charging ports. Like all technologies, a certain degree of standardization is utmost necessary for large scale adoption. Integration of the internet with vehicle and bi-directional charging infrastructure will open infinite opportunities for collaboration and convenience. Time ahead is very interesting and a lot of work needs to be done in this area to bring these technologies into practice. Imagine just buying a car and leasing the battery. This will almost halve the price of the vehicles and the cost of that battery can be recovered from sharing the revenue from trading electricity with the battery leasing company. This will cover the cost of the battery. All this sounds very cool, but one very glaring limitation of V2G, V2V or V2H is the battery life cycle. The current battery chemistry is not resilient to tens of thousands of cycles. Sharing a battery with the grid or your home will only reduce the life cycle of the car and in future will generate piles of battery waste. Practically speaking, we do not have enough provisions for battery manufacturing to meet the upcoming demand. If technologies like V2G or V2V or maybe even battery swapping are brought into practice, they will further strain the rather stressed supply chain. Practically speaking, we do not have enough provisions for battery manufacturing to meet the upcoming demand of vehicles. If technologies like V2G or battery swapping are brought into practice, they will further strain the rather stressed supply chain. Until there is a significant improvement in battery materials resulting in higher life cycles and better thermal management, implementing V2G in practice will not be economically and socially feasible. This was the last chapter of the charging technology module. In the next module, Rishikesh will guide your learning of the most crucial part of the vehicle, the drivetrain.